Good morning. Today we're looking at the story of Eve and how her story gets picked up in the Jewish and Christian traditions of interpretation. Why? Well, it seems like I opened my big fat mouth and a number of people said, hey, that would be a great idea for a video and they asked if I could do it. So let's see if we can address that today. We often think of a text as a fixed object. Once it's written, it's out there and it doesn't change. And anyone can look at it and read it and they'll have the same meaning that everybody else does when they read it. Now that might work for a few texts that are written today and are read almost immediately. But once a text develops some mileage behind it, those ideas change. When we look at the history of how the Bible has been interpreted, we notice that even for a fairly straightforward text, we end up with interpretations that are really quite divergent from one another. Different interpretations shape the way that later readers will also read and understand the text as well. So in a certain sense, we're no longer just reading the Bible, but we're reading it with all those who have come before us. And this is why I wrote a particular book on that subject, Reading the Bible with the Giants. And I'll link to that underneath. Instead of seeing the Bible or any great text as a fixed immutable object, I would like to propose another way of looking at them. See them as a lake or a spring that is the source of a river. As that river flows through history, it takes on additional tributaries of meaning, twists and turns, and some rather surprising developments. We're still concerned with the original text or that original lake or spring, but we need to realize that we're interpreting it from our particular place within that river. My wife and I had the chance a few years ago to ride our bikes across Germany following the Main River. We started in Bayreuth in the east and then ended up with Mainz am Rhein in the west. Along the route, we watched this river grow from about a 10 foot wide stream in Bayreuth to a huge river with ocean going ships by the time it hit the Rhine River. In a similar manner, our tradition for interpreting the Bible is very rich and deep as well, with all sorts of interesting twists and turns and scenic views within it. We stand at a place in this river that's over 2,000 years downstream from that source, that spring, the Bible itself. This is what it means to be part of the church, to understand how God has been shaping and guiding the church during all of this time. So our goal in this video is to take a scenic tour along the river of Eve's story and how it's been interpreted and how it is shaped, how we interpret Genesis 3 and 4 as a result. Along the way, we're going to look at some ancient extra biblical texts, some of the church fathers, medieval manuscripts, and some artwork. Okay, I should give you a heads up on that one. Most of the depictions of Adam and Eve in art are naked, and so squint real hard or turn away if that offends you. Adam and Eve's story in Genesis is perhaps one of the most fundamental stories in Western tradition that shapes our understanding of men and women. I'm not going to spend much time looking at the text of Genesis 2, 3, and 4 in this video because I already have three videos up on those chapters. And if you're interested, take a look at those down below or I'll have a link to at least one of them up over here. Now, there are a phenomenal amount of text, interpretations, and artworks that contribute to this river of the interpretation of Eve's story. And it would be foolhardy on my part to say that I can cover or touch on all of those in this video. But what I hope to do is introduce you to them and try and organize them around five different trajectories or tributaries of interpretation to continue this river metaphor. Tributary number one, silence. This is sort of the anti-trajectory. What I find absolutely interesting is that from the time Genesis was written until close to the time in the New Testament, there is nary a whisper or hint of the interpretation of Adam and Eve's story in the Hebrew scriptures. Nada. Crickets. The first mention of Adam and Eve is found in an extra biblical text around 300 to 200 BC, the book of Tobit. And in that, Tobiah and Sarah mention Adam and Eve in their prayers or in their wedding night. 
Now, when they pray this, it's a very positive reference to marriage being part of God's plan. About a hundred years later, the Jewish extra-biblical text of Ben Sira mentions how God created mankind from the earth. Now, this text follows Genesis pretty closely. People were creating God's image, and at death, man would return to the dirt that he was taken from. About a hundred years later, in 100 BC, the Book of Wisdom, or the Wisdom of Solomon, comes along. In chapter 2, verses 23 through 24, we are told that God created man incorruptible and immortal. I'm going to read it here for you. For God created man to be immortal, and he made him an image of his own eternity. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. Now, the interesting contribution is how the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 is now identified as the Diabolos or the devil. This is the first time that the serpent is linked with the devil. Tributary number two, Eve as the first gullible sinner. Eve is pictured as being easily led astray by the serpent. Her vanity and greed prompt her to eat of the tree. Now, in this line of interpretation, the serpent's deception is aimed only at Eve. Adam's culpability in this is completely ignored. This really seems to fly in the face of Genesis 3, verses 4 through 5. In the biblical text, when the serpent speaks to Adam and Eve, he uses verbs that are in the second person, masculine plural. Or if I was a southerner, I would say, y'all. In other words, he's speaking to both Adam and Eve. He's using this plural verb. Even though Eve is the only person who responds to the serpent in the story, Adam is definitely pictured as present and that the serpent is addressing him as well as Eve in Genesis. Now, if we return to the text of Ben Sira, chapter 25 this time, we have an interesting addition to how this temptation story is understood. In 25, verse 24, from a woman, sin had its beginning, and because of her, we all die. Now, alongside this, we need to add that in Greek thought, especially in the works of Aristotle, women were seen as imperfectly formed men. In other words, when they were in their mother's womb, they were not completely formed. As a result, they are weaker and have weaker minds than men. They're more impulsive and easier to deceive, and by nature, deceptive as well. As a result, Aristotle and other Greek thinkers argue that a woman should be under her husband's authority. Plato is perhaps an exception to this. He thought that women had the same rational potential as men, but men were stronger and more virtuous. Now, we need to realize that as the Jewish and Christian community spread out into the wider Greco-Roman culture, they were influenced by these views of women as well. Just as the church today is often shaped and influenced by wider movements within our culture. Slightly before Paul wrote, the Jewish author Philo, who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, wrote that women embodied and symbolized sensuality while men reasoned. In the Garden of Eden, according to Philo, the serpent symbolized sensuality and pleasure. This is why Eve was tempted and not Adam, and why Eve was deceived and Adam wasn't. He writes, For the feminine always falls short and is inferior to the masculine, which has priority. What's interesting is that in his letters, Paul picks up this line of interpretation. For example, in 1 Timothy, he writes, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. She must remain quiet. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman, because she was fully deceived and fell into transgression. What is really interesting here is that Paul purposely ignores that Adam was present with Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and was addressed by the serpent as well. We need to realize that he is instructing Timothy about how to counter false teachers in the church at Ephesus. And the main way they were gaining access into the church was through women. 
And so Paul seems to pick up thoughts from this trajectory of interpretation off Eve's story and then uses it as an application point for how Timothy should move forward with leadership within his church. The main thing I want to bring out here is that Paul was heavily influenced by these values of other interpreters that came before him. He definitely sees that Eve was deceived, but he doesn't lay particular blame on Adam. This is something that he inherited, but is not in the text of Genesis. Moving on a little bit further in this trajectory, around 350 to 400 AD, John Chrysostom defined women as weaker and more liable to deception than men. By doing so, he blends his reading of biblical texts with Greco-Roman values. For example, when he interprets Genesis chapter 3, he thinks that when Eve was deceived by the serpent, it's because that she not only saw that the tree was good to eat, which allegedly this means, according to him, is that she was captivated by her desires. While the man, or Adam, transgressed because of the persuasion of his wife, Eve. This line of interpretation that Eve, and by extension all women, are more easily deceived and intellectually inferior to Adam, is a dominant line of thought in the church. It runs from Chrysostom, through Augustine to Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther. In fact, today it is not uncommon to find various people putting forward the idea that women are not as mentally strong as men, and in this way they should not be in positions of leadership. Around 1300 AD, the Florentine author Giovanni Boccaccio wrote a very influential book during his day, De Mulibarius Claris, or Famous Women. In it, he looks at the lives of 106 famous women through history. He starts with Eve, and in regard to her, he writes, Yet since women count beauty among their foremost endowments and have achieved, owing to the superficial judgment of mortals, much glory on that account, it will not seem excessive to place beauty here in the following pages as the most dazzling aspect of their fame. For Giovanni Boccaccio, the most dazzling or the most important aspect of women is their beauty. This, then, is the avenue by which the serpent deceived Eve. She could have greater glory if she disobeyed God, and so he writes, Eve believed him more than it was good for her or for us. Foolishly, she thought that she was about to rise to greater heights, and her first step was to flatter her pliant husband into her way of thinking. During the patristic and medieval period, Eve is not pictured as a helper or being equal to Adam, as in Genesis 2. Rather, she is morally and intellectually inferior to Adam. And thus, Eve, and by extension all women, were dangerous. We cannot trust what they would introduce into the church or society because they are easily deceived. This is why they argued that women must be subject to men and were not worthy of public ministry or positions. When we reach the Reformation, Martin Luther is a very interesting character. He argues that while men and women are equal before God, there is also a difference between them. He writes, For as the sun is more excellent than the moon, although the moon, too, is a very excellent body, so the woman, although she is a most beautiful work of God, nevertheless was not the equal part of the male in glory and prestige. This is why the serpent approached the woman. She was weaker and more pliant as opposed to Adam. We may not use the same words today, but especially within conservative circles, this idea that Eve was deceived, not Adam, and that by extension women are more susceptible to deception than men for a number of reasons is echoed in many ways to justify not allowing women positions of leadership within the church. Notice how this trajectory tries to fill in gaps or ambiguities in the Genesis story, especially chapters 2 and 3. But in doing so, they overemphasize Eve's gullibility and they erase Adam's participation in the temptation. This brings us to trajectory number three, Eve as a temptress. Before we dive into this trajectory very far, I want you to notice one thing in Genesis 2 and 3. 
Sexuality is completely absent from the Genesis account of the temptation. Adam is not seduced by Eve to eat of the fruit of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like the previous tributary of interpretation, in this line of interpretation, Adam is not present when Eve eats from the tree. So how did Eve convince Adam to eat also? Now in this line of interpretation, the interpreters read into the story the idea that Eve's beauty and feminine wiles enticed Adam, and as a result, he ate also. In some instances, it's implied that her temptation of Adam was overtly sexual in nature. Let's start with a text that was really popular during the 13th century, the Speculum Humanae Salvationis. Now in this text, Eve is not only presented in very harsh terms for being responsible for the fall, but she also seduced Adam to get him to eat the fruit as well. And in fact, the Morgan Library in New York has a digitized version of the Speculum Humanae Salvationis online, and I'll include a link down below. Lucas Cranach, the elder's depiction of Adam and Eve is a good example of this. Eve has eaten from the tree already and she leans seductively back against the tree. At the same time, she is almost pushing the apple into Adam's mouth and he appears to look as if he's not sure what he should do at this very moment. But Eve is clearly portrayed as a temptress seducing Adam with the fruit. In another two panel depiction by Cranach, Eve holds the apple up towards Adam. Adam's gaze is depicted at the fruit, but the way Cranach carefully arranged the composition, Adam's gaze is not just looking directly at the fruit, but extends past that to her breasts as well. Eve not only tempted Adam with the fruit, but this temptation involved her sexuality as well. And finally, with Pantalone Schindler's depiction of Eve in 1889, the nature of the temptation needs no explanation here at all. Just as a side note, and I'll throw this in for free. If you were an artist during the medieval or Renaissance periods, you just couldn't go around painting nudes. But if it was a biblical or a classical story that somehow involved nudity, then that was okay. This explains why Adam and Eve were so popular with artists during this period. Tributary number four, Eve as the person who introduces wisdom to humanity. Going back to Genesis chapter three, in the Garden of Eden story, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was something that was good. And when the serpent tempted Eve, she saw that the fruit of this tree was good and desirable for making one wise. In the infancy of the church, Gnosticism was a particular strand of teaching that was condemned by the early church fathers. Now there's a lot of ideas about what the Gnostics taught, but one idea seems central, that Jesus taught a secret form of wisdom or Gnosis that once gained allowed one to have salvation. In the Gnostic accounts of creation, Eve is portrayed in a very positive light it was her decision to eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil that introduced spiritual knowledge and insight to humanity. This opened the door for salvation. While the Gnostic authors definitely picked up on the goodness of the tree and its value, they ignored the consequences of Adam and Eve's actions in the garden. Remember the exegete's cheer, context, context, context. What does this author mean with these words in this particular text or story? Adam and Eve's actions need to be understood within the entire context of Genesis 2, 3, and 4. While this tree was good for knowledge, their decision to eat from it was catastrophic. Aside from the Gnostic teachers, this line of thought is really not picked up anywhere else except within the teachings of Mormonism. According to Joseph Smith, Adam and Eve did not fall, but made a wise decision to eat from the tree. This then opens the door for anyone to attain godhood and supports the idea that we have a heavenly father as well as a heavenly mother. Eve's decision to eat from the tree was a brave spiritual insight that has profound blessings on humanity, according to Mormon teachings.
One of the advantages of studying the history of interpretation is that not only do we see how our interpretation of a text has been shaped by our tradition, but also it reveals to us dead ends or wrong turns in that interpretive history. This brings us to tributary number five, Eve as the mother of all living. In Genesis 3.20, Adam names the woman Eve because she is the mother of all living. When God cursed Eve, he said that she will bear children in pain and that her seed would crush the head of the serpent. And then in Genesis chapter four, we have the story about her bearing children. It opens with her statement of, I have obtained or created a man with or just like God. And then you have the birth of Abel after him. Genesis chapter four concludes with her being given another child by God, whom she names Seth. This idea of Eve being the mother of all living is hinted at in several Old Testament passages and New Testament passages as well. However, it's too clearly evident in two of Paul's letters. If we return to 1 Timothy 2, the passage that we read earlier, Paul continues in verse 15, but she will be delivered through childbearing if she continues in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Eve, as the mother of all living, stands behind Paul's argument here. And in a positive way, if we compare this passage, for example, to Ben Sira that we looked earlier, Ben Sira says, for a woman, sin had its beginning, and because of her, we all die. Notice that Paul takes a completely different reading here. There is no mention of sin and death, and as a result of Eve's action, we have life instead. The other passage where Paul picks up this idea of Eve as the mother of all living is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In that passage, Paul is writing to answer a question that the Corinthians had asked him. It probably went something along the lines of, when a woman prays and prophecies within the church, should they have their head covered? Now notice in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2, that whatever the problem is there, it is a good problem. Paul starts off, I praise you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions. So whatever the question here is about women praying and prophesying within the church, this is a good problem. It just needs some minor tweaks and adjustments. Paul then goes through an argument from culture about men and women and hair. Towards the end of his argument, he makes an interesting appeal to Genesis chapters two and three. He starts off with this idea of primogenitor, or that Adam came first, therefore Eve. But then in verse 12, he makes this very interesting statement. For just as woman came from a man, primogenitor in the previous verses, so man comes through women, but all things come from God. In other words, he's creating sort of a Mexican standoff or a balance here. Yes, Adam was created first and then woman, and so this influences how women should behave within the church. Ever since then, every man has come out of a woman. In other words, Eve was taken out of Adam in the original creation story, but ever since the garden, every man has been taken out of a woman. If that's the case, then 1 Corinthians 11 seems to preserve an image of Eve as the mother of all living when Paul makes his argument there. This argument of Eve being the mother of all living is developed further when we look through the interpreters within the church. Mary is the mother of the church, and she is then linked up with Eve. As Adam was a type of Christ, Eve is then seen as a type of Mary. Eve was a mother and the source of all human life. This then is extended to speak about and allegorically the church. Ambrose and Augustine during the fourth century developed this line of thought. Since Adam was a type of Christ, Eve as Adam's helper was seen as a type of the church. Others saw parallels between Eve's mourning over her loss of Cain and the death of Abel with Mary's lamentations over Jesus at his death. We can see this depicted in the bronze doors at the Hildesheim Cathedral in Germany. On the left door, Eve is pictured sitting with one of her children, Cain or Seth, we're not sure. 
And in that panel, she is connected with the fall of humanity. On the right door, we see Mary in a very, very similar posture holding Jesus. And we see this connection between the two. Eve being the mother of all living and the fall. Mary being the mother of Jesus and the mother of the church. Now this tributary of interpretation that Eve is the mother of all living or as a type of the church seems to really come to an end by the time of the Reformation. We really don't find that much in use today. Eve's story in Genesis has generated a fairly deep river of interpretation. Some of these readings have proven to be interpretive dead ends, the idea that she introduced wisdom to the world. Others, like her being more gullible and thus deceived by the serpent, really comes down to us today and is applied by extension to all women, especially in their roles of teaching and leading within the church. Yet its roots in Aristotelian thought or Jewish apocryphal texts are not questioned. Eve as a temptress was a very popular tributary of interpretation as well, especially in artworks. In fact, this tradition even comes down to us today. In the movie Ex Machina, the woman in that story has to sexually sort of seduce the male in order to escape into the world. I'm not going to tell you anymore. You got to go watch it yourself. Yet there is nothing in the genocide account that supports this. Rather, it's an imaginative contribution to explain why the stronger, morally superior man was tempted to follow Eve in eating the fruit. And then Eve, as the mother of all living, was picked up by the early church and also in Paul's theological reflections, yet it's rarely mentioned or developed today. I hope this short trip down the river interpretation has opened your eyes to some of the riches in the history of biblical interpretation. Not only does it contain streams of thought that inform why we read the Bible the way we do, and illuminate possible lines that we should recover, but it also shows exegetical eddies that we should avoid. It presents us with a map that is far more detailed and nuanced than we often think, and yet we stand right in the middle of that river. We are heirs of it, and we will pass it along to those who come after us. I'm going to end there, but once again, take a moment to subscribe, give this video a thumbs up if you found it useful or informative. That helps YouTube know that this is a good video and they'll recommend it to other people. So thank you very much for taking a moment to do that. Till next week, peace.